In this lecture segment, we'll review some C string basics and then look at strings from a pointer perspective. So let's start with a review of what you've learned in prior C work. C strings are usually held in character arrays like uh, string 1 and string 2 on line 17 of our code example. You can, for instance, uh, pass such arrays to scanf and uh, use a percent %s format specifier. Ignore the 9, by the way, for the moment. We'll get back to it in a second. Uh, and scanf will read strings from the input, blank delimited, into the arrays. In our example, you can see in the output sample down below, we uh, enter the strings uh, professor and uh, project, and uh, those go into the strings, uh, or arrays, I should say, string 1 and uh, string 2. Printf also works uh, with the format specifier percent %s and with character arrays, like on line 27 uh, here. But as the diagram indicates, neither of these strings completely fills its array. And in general, one cannot predict exactly how long an entered string might be. So we often have extra uninitialized elements at the end of character arrays holding strings. How is the computer to tell whether string 2, for instance, contains a project or a you know, project uh, and some garbage at the end? C solves this problem by designating one ASCII character, null, uh, as an end of string marker. All strings automatically end with this character. Scanf adds a null automatically when reading your strings. Printf stops printing when it hits null. Null is writable in code as backslash zero, and I'll add it to the uh, arrays here accordingly. Um, it has the very lowest ASCII code, number zero. Normally, a character's uh, specific ASCII code isn't too important, but we'll find that ending strings with character code zero makes certain string operations much simpler as we go on with the lecture. So the full diagram of string 1 and string 2 now show the null characters at the end. And interestingly, by the way, this means that string 1 is full up with the nine characters of professor and the null at the end. Uh, this is an important point. C strings always require one extra space for the terminating null. So what's the 9 for in the scanf format specifiers here? It's a field length limit. And it tells scanf to stop reading after nine characters, not counting the null, so as not to overflow the arrays. Otherwise, scanf reads in whatever is typed without checking if there's enough space. A malicious user typing anti-disestablishmentarianism will trash your memory past the end of the array. In fact, string length vulnerabilities are a major source of security flaws in C code. Now, also a part of review, if you compare strings directly, like we do on line 22, that doesn't work. Nor can you uh, assign one character array into another. You can't say string 1 equals string 2. Instead, we lose the, use the uh, library functions strcomp and strcopy, respectively, to compare and to copy two character arrays string contents. Now, our code example doesn't actually use these, since it has its own functions named strcomp with caps and stir copy with caps, and we'll be analyzing those there in the code above. But the two functions that we have work exactly like the real ones from the library, and so the calls to them on lines 25 and on lines 26 are, are good examples. Now, by way of reminder, stir comp takes two character arrays and compares their content lexicographically. That's a fancy word for as in the dictionary, since lexicon is a $50 word for dictionary. That's just standard sorted order, including the rule that if one string is a strict prefix of another, like cat versus catalog, then the shorter string is less. It falls earlier in sorted order. Stirkomp returns an integer, a negative value, not necessarily minus 1, if the first string parameter is less, a 0 if the two parameters have identical content, and a positive value, again not necessarily 1, if the first parameter is greater. Now that rule can be hard to remember, so here's a mnemonic. It's as if strcomp subtracts the second string from the first, so that strcomp string 1 string 2 is like string 1 minus string 2, in the sense that if string 1 were larger, we'd expect a positive difference. 
If they were equal, we'd expect zero difference. If string one were smaller, we'd expect a negative difference. So try to remember it as like a subtraction. It's um, also worth noting that this way of getting one function to give you all three possible results is another C legacy. It's been passed along into many other languages, including Java, C Sharp, etc., all of which have compare methods that return negative, zero, or positive in the same way as stir-comp. Now, stir-copy copies its second parameter into the first. And again, it's a slightly odd rule to remember, but note that this makes stir-copy like an assignment statement copying the right-hand side into the left-hand side. And recall that in order to use stir-comp, stir-copy, or any of the other string library functions, you have to add a pound include string.h at the top of your source file. Okay, that's it for the somewhat lengthy review of string concepts in C in this segment. Now let's look at how pointers mix in with all of this. First, when I said that scanf and printf take character arrays, that wasn't strictly true. As we know, when you pass the name of an array alone, you're passing the address of its first element. So what scanf and printf and indeed all the string function functions expect is a character pointer. If we got that from an array, fine, but we'll see there are other ways to obtain a character pointer to the first character of a string. Second, now that we understand pointers, we're in a position to see why line 22 here does not work. So, question one. Under what circumstances, if any, will the test on line 22 return true? You should find the answer a little bit amusing when you realize what that test really does. So, coming back from a pause, uh, the answer is it will never return true because it's effectively asking if string 1 and string 2 have the same starting address, which clearly they don't, uh, since they're different arrays, uh, regardless of their content. Question number two here. You're uh, even allowed to write uh, if string 1 is less than string 2. That compiles. But what even more useless thing do you think that does? Again, coming back from the pause. It determines whether string 1 appears earlier in memory than string 2. That would be the case if string 1's starting address were smaller. You can compare pointers directly like this, by the way, if they're of the same target type. Sometimes this is useful if the pointers are pointing into the same array. You can tell which one's earlier or later in the array, but usually it's useless information. Now question number three here. To be complete, Assigning character arrays, thus, string1 equals string2, is not only useless, it won't compile. Why exactly? I'm looking for a specific vocabulary term from an earlier lecture. I'm back from a pause there. String1, a fixed address, is not an L value as noted in earlier lectures. It cannot be assigned into any more than 42 or square root of 3.14 can be. So that doesn't work. So then what about line 30 here? Is that assignment legal? Well, sure, because string one or string three, I'm sorry, is an L value. It's a pointer, not an array. Notice how it was declared up here. So the assignment points string 3 to the start of string 2, thus. Okay, so here's question 4. We're passing string 3 to printf on line 31. Will printf accept a character pointer instead of an array? And why, if so? And coming back from a pause, the answer is fairly direct. Because, as we indicated earlier, functions that work on strings really only expect character pointers because that's all you can pass anyway. Passing the array name just passes the address of the first element. Printf can't tell the difference, and it doesn't care. All you have to do is give it the address of a series of characters ending with null, and it's happy. Okay, so how do string constants fit into all this? You've used string constants since your first Hello World program. How do uh, constants like, say, enter two strings fit the pointer model of strings? Well, let's look at the initialization of the care pointer FMT here. 
we use a string constant to initialize it. Is a string constant a character pointer? Yes. Oddly enough, it is. The compiler takes each string constant in your code and copies the content between the quotes, with the null tacked onto the end, into a designated area of memory called the string table. Like I'm showing here, and you can see in the string table I've got all of the string constants in the program jammed together, and the one we're talking about in particular is right there in the middle. The compiler then replaces the entire string content in your code with a character pointer to the first care in the string table, as we'll show in the diagram here. So what looks like a string constant actually becomes a character pointer to a string table entry containing that string. And the initialization of FMT makes FMT point into the string table as well. So what does this tell us about the first parameter of scanf and printf, the format strings, which have up to now always been string constants? Right? Scanf and printf are C functions, like any other, and they have function headers. Based on what we just learned about string constants, here's question five. What does the declaration of the first parameter of scanf or printf look like? Show me the header for scanner and uh, scanf and printf up to the first parameter. And coming back from the pause, you should come up with you know, something like this. The declaration for scanf, for instance, and scanf does return an int, as you may know, is int scanf and then care star format for the format string. Okay, so does that mean I can pass any character pointer I want as the format string? Sure, as we do on line 35 right here. And as we might do in one of the LMQs, by the way. We might also have assembled a format string in a character array and passed the array as printf's first parameter. So, question six. How does printf know that in one case its format is a string constant? And in another case, it's the address of a character array containing the format string. And answer six, after a pause, I'll stop doing this after this question, but the answer is the same as before. Printf doesn't know and it doesn't care. The format care pointer may be pointing to a string table entry, an array, or what have you. It just follows the character pointer to wherever it points, and it reads the characters at that location as its format string until it reaches a null. The same principle applies to any function that expects a character pointer. A string constant will do just as well, as we show on lines 33 and 34, in fact, here, where we use string constants, and stir comp and stir copier are none the wiser. A character pointer is a character pointer. Uh, don't, by the way, pass a string constant as the first parameter to stir copy. It would overwrite the string constant itself in the string table if you did that. So. In the final estimation, a C string doesn't have to be in a care array. That's optional. The real definition of a C string is a character pointer to the start of a sequence of characters ending with null. That's it. It doesn't matter how you set up the sequence. In an array, as a string constant, by dynamic memory allocation, something we'll look at in a little bit, or by magic, as long as you have a character pointer to a null terminated care sequence, you've got a string, and all the string library functions will work with it. Now, before we close this segment, now that we understand about string constants in the string table, we're in a position to understand an uh, interesting debugging phenomenon that every C programmer encounters eventually. So this is going to be one of our little war story asides here. You're working on a bit of code with an inexplicable seg fault or a similar runtime error, and you put a printf into the code to track what's happening. You know, printf got to here. Uh, or maybe it's a little more profane than that if it's 3 o'clock in the morning. You run the program, and uh, the bug is gone. The debug printf runs, and you get its output, but the bug is also cured. Now, you have no idea why, but especially if it's 3 a.m., you're not inclined to question your good fortune, and, and with relief, you remove the now unneeded debug printf, and the bug returns. So what the heck is this? 
Just to be sure you're not delusional from lack of sleep, you reinsert printf, and sure enough, the bug goes away until you remove the printf, and then the bug comes back. So this bug is taunting you. You're surely tempted at this point to just submit or release the code with the spurious debug printf, because you figure, but you, know, you figure someone's sure to notice, unfortunately, so you can't get away with that. So, so what do you do? I like to call these Heisenberg bugs. That's just a private term, not something recognized by the field. And it's in honor, of course, of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which, as you may know, says that it's impossible to observe a phenomenon without affecting it. What's almost always happening is that the printf introduces a new string in a new string constant, your got to here, damn it, into the string table. This slightly adjusts the layout of memory in the string table, enlarging it and shifting the rest of the program memory as well. What was a lucky, meaning visible, bug now becomes unlucky. It's not cured. The bug is still there, just masked when the printf is present. So the trick is to get it to show even with the printf. And this can almost always be done by reducing the size of the string in the printf to change the amount of memory shifting. So, you know, it's printf, something small, and the bug will reappear generally even in the presence of the printf.